Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this afternoon's Eating Disorders CoLab Lab. Um, it has been absolutely lovely to see everyone joining the room, and I'm sure there'll be still a few people um, jumping online uh, in the next few minutes. I'm Sarah Trove, and I'm going to be your host this afternoon, and I'll also be joined by four um, moderators to support us through, through the program. Um, before we get started, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we're all meeting today from all corners of this country, um, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. I live and work and I'm joining you here today from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present, and also extend my respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today, and acknowledge your deep connection to land, sea and community. So today's session is really exciting. It's the first CoLab Lab for uh, the MHPN conference. Thank you for taking the time um, this afternoon. I know everyone's clinical schedules are fairly packed. So to take this time out to really expand your knowledge and understanding of working in the area of eating disorders. Um, it's a really big audience and we know that you are coming from all parts of the country and from many dis like different disciplines and job roles. So again, I've just been looking at the, the titles attached to your um, faces in, in, the, in the platform and it's, um, it's really, really lovely to see, um, especially given the, um, I guess, the theme and the, the spirit of today's session is to learn about interdisciplinary collaborative care. So we need to be thinking about the different professions that are involved in eating disorder care and also across services, across organisations and given telehealth sometimes across um, state and territory borders. So in terms of today's uh, learning objectives, we are going to be really focusing on um, how we engage in interdisciplinary collaborative care when we're responding to people experiencing eating disorders across diagnostic presentations um, and understanding then how this collaborative care can really lead to better outcomes for eating disorder presentations. I'm going to be providing you some information to, uh, I guess, help facilitate the discussions that you're going to have in some of the breakout rooms later on. And so there'll be some general um, eating disorder information provided at the start. I'm going to acknowledge that there will be a range of different, uh, I guess, levels of experience in the room today from people who've got a lot of experience in eating disorders and collaborative care is just part of your everyday job um, versus people where this might be something quite new for them. And I want to take the opportunity today when there are so many people here to learn to um, to provide pathways for further um, learning and professional development, especially if you are starting out new. So to those more experienced people in the room, Sorry if some of the initial content is a little bit, um, I guess, repetitive and, and not new for you, but it really does in, underpin and provide you the foundation to engage in the conversation later on. So we've got a three-part activity today. So we've got about a half an hour together in this room um, to start with. As I said, I'm going to give you an overview around your role in the system of care and thinking about, you know, um, providing, uh, completing a comprehensive assessment and developing a formulation and, and care and treatment plan. And then uh, we'll be moving into section two, which extends for about an hour. And that's where the fun um, and engagement happens. So you're going to be moving into one of four rooms um, in which you'll be um, focusing on a specific vignette or case study. And um, the moderator will guide you through a series of questions to help you think about um, what needs to happen for this person, um, in, you know, and the care, um, I guess the care team that needs to be involved and how that care team will be working together. In the final 30 minutes, we'll rejoin here into the main room. Um, each of the moderators will be feeding back um, to the whole group on the main learnings from um, their vignette and we'll be doing just a bit of a summary of the session. Um, there will, of course, be resources that are provided, or links to resources provided to you at the end of the session um, and you'll be able to access those through MHPN also. So mindful of large numbers, and I guess we've all learned over the last few years about how to interact online. Um, for this first section, um, there'll be the chat feature is available um, on the right hand side of your screen. And on the next slide, I'll show you where that's um, situated. And while we like I'll be fielding the content questions, sorry, we won't be fielding the content related questions there. But if anything pops up that I feel can be addressed in that final section, I will endeavour to do so. But you can really use that chat, chat function to um, engage with other delegates in the room, to share links or thoughts on, on what's being presented. 
If you need technical help, so if there's issues with your sound or video, please use the Q&A function. Um, once you do go into the um, breakout room, so the section two, there'll be a lot more interaction uh, with the other delegates and with the moderator, and your moderator will guide you through how that's going to happen and be asking specific questions for you to respond to. We do really ask um, for you to leave your camera on when you're in those breakout rooms. We can just pretend that we're in the room together um, so that we can um, really collaborate and engage around the content. So this is a, just a little image of what should be seen on your screen. So you can see the chat. So that's for your thoughts, ideas, questions, and um, Q&A. You'll be using that more um, once you're in the um, breakout rooms that there'll be some little polls and things that pop up there and if you're needing any tech support. So diving into the eating disorder content, this is going to be a little bit of a whirlwind tour and I'll get through as much as I can in the time we've got. So um, the moderators that are joining me today and helping me through um, the program are Amy Davis um, and she's an accredited practicing, uh, practicing dietitian both in private practice and in public mental health. Um, my colleague, Dr. Emma Spiel, who's the Workforce Development Coordinator um, at NADC and also a clinical psychologist. Um, Katrina Henry, um, accredited mental health social worker and also senior social worker at the Central Coast Eating Disorders Outpatient Service. And Rachel Knight, who is a mental health occupational therapist um, and lecturer at Deakin and experience across um, clinical work and also service development. We will um, meet them on the screen a little bit later on. So this is something we term the eating disorder step system of care. And what this really provides us is a framework to understand the role of mental health professionals and many other professionals in the identification and response to eating disorders. Um, I guess they're kind of action pillars, if you can think of that there are actions and responses that we need to do around the prevention of eating disorders. We need to be able to identify um, early symptoms and signs. We need to be able to respond to the early symptoms and signs and doing uh, a comprehensive assessment. We need to support that person to access the treatment for the eating disorder and engage in any other psychosocial supports that might be um, needed to really support a person to um, I guess, get back to their full and functioning life. So what the, the gold standard is and what NEDC is striving for is to have a really coordinated and connected system of care. So that means that when um, early signs and symptoms are identified, um, that is easily connected to someone who can respond and do a comprehensive assessment. After the assessment is done, that is then connected into a treatment that is provided at an intensity that really meets the needs of the person. Um, I guess it's not linear. A person's um, uh, journey through the system of care may not just go through identification, response, treatment and recovery. That we move up and down and, and I guess the services need to respond in a way that, um, that can increase or decrease in intensity depending on the person's psychological needs, physical, nutritional and, of course, their functional needs to look at the whole of person and their quality of life. So I want us to keep this framework in mind as we're working through the next few sections and especially once you move into your breakout rooms and you're thinking through a vignette and developing a care plan for a person, what needs to happen in this system of care to really support a person to get what they need. Um, I will just point out there's a little clipboard indicator on the right hand corner of the slide. This means that this is a resource. So um, MHPN will be providing you a list of all of the resources that um, myself and the moderators have put together. And so if you see the clipboard, you are going to receive that resource. So you don't have to um, worry about scribbling down notes about what you want to access a little bit later on. So what does your role in the system of care look like? When you look and look at a framework like that and think about your scope of practice and your professional role and where you're working, you might be thinking, oh, What's my, what's my position? What am I supposed to be doing? So for mental health professionals, a really key role in, act, you know, proactively identifying people who might be experiencing eating disorders and definitely screening at-risk groups. So with the right training and experience, we'd be doing a comprehensive assessment, um, providing evidence-based mental health treatment. 
for um, GPs and other medical practitioners in the room, we'd be providing the medical management to support um, that person um, through the, medic, the, I guess, the physical impacts of the eating disorder. Dietitians would be providing dietetic interventions. A number of different professional groups would be providing psychosocial support. So thinking about how we're supporting a person to get back into their occupation and their just normal, um, I guess, activities of daily living. Um, we'd be understanding the system of care and making referrals for a person where is where uh, I guess where is necessary and appropriate. We might be leading that care team. So when a person is accessing services across um, different individuals and service settings, it's really important that there is coordination. And so um, our, a mental health professional might have a key role in that. And everyone and that's mental health professionals, but also us as just individuals, we all have a role in preventing eating disorders. Now, that can be through the language we use um, and also through early intervention and patient education. Um, I just realised something just came to mind that I do just want to skip back up to something here, um, that um, when we're talking about eating disorders, some of this content might be triggering for people. Um, and so we're just going to pop in the chat function um, the contact details for the Butterfly Foundation in the case that you do want to talk to anyone. Um, we know that group members bring a range of different backgrounds and experiences, and that may include um, lived experience, um, and that might be for yourself or also caring for someone that you know. Um, we're really mindful of language in this session. And so um, please be aware of um, the impacts of, of weight stigma and the importance of using affirming and inclusive language. And our moderators will also be going through some of that information when you join the breakout rooms, when there is more opportunity for you to engage. So sorry for um, just remembering that now, but um, just be mindful of language and, and that there is support available if anything that we're talking about um, brings something up for you. I'm just going to skip back down here. So in thinking about our role in the system of care then, I'm going to guide us through some information to support you to be able to identify. I'm not going to cover assessment in detail, but then thinking about how you would um, develop a care plan for a person. So to really identify eating disorder symptoms uh, and signs, we need to know what we're talking about. What is an eating disorder? What are the different diagnostic presentations that we'd be thinking about? What's the prevalence? Um, and that's really breaking down some of the stigma about you know, who gets eating disorders, how, you know, how um, prevalent are they in Australia and what diagnostic presentations are more common than others. Risk factors, um, so we're proactively screening, as I said, the high-risk groups and presentations. So what are eating disorders? Uh, they're serious, complex mental illnesses, and that's really why we're talking about it today because they are a mental illness that requires a mental health response just like depression or anxiety or obsessive compulsive disorder, they need a mental health response. And so as mental health prof professionals, we need to equip ourselves to be able to make the right response depending on where we're working. With eating disorders, they come with, you know, physical and psychiatric complications. And sometimes that can be where the anxiety arises with eating disorders that a mental health professional thinks, you know, how am I going to manage that physical risk? And that was definitely something that I experienced early in my career. So with eating disorders, we always work in the collaborative care space. So that's why this topic is perfect for the CoLab Lab, that we always work from a multidisciplinary approach of a minimum men mental health and medical team to address those core symptoms. Eating disorders um, across diagnostic presentations are characterised by disturbances in behaviours, so around um, eating behaviours and um, physical activity behaviours, thoughts and feelings towards their body and shape, and also in food and eating. I'm going to give you just a really high level um, description of some of the um, most of the eating disorders that we're going to talk about today. The reason being is when I'm talking about the, the high level criteria, I want you to think about what impact would that have on somebody's life? And because that will then determine what is your treatment plan going to look like? So for binge eating disorder, that's um, characterised by recurrent episodes of binge eating where the person feels unable to stop themselves eating. It's associated with marked distress and guilt and it's not associated with compensatory behaviours that you would see in bulimia nervosa, such as excessive exercise, vomiting, the use of diuretics. 
So if we think about something, um, for, uh, an experience for someone with binge eating disorder, there can be, a, I guess, the triggers can be multifaceted. So it's really exploring what might be leading to the person um, binge eating. Um, and in the, the breakout room, you'll be exploring that, I think, with um, Rachel. So for bulimia nervosa, it is the binge eating followed by the inappropriate compensatory behaviours to prevent the weight gain. So someone is... a um, and the body image disturbance is there. So someone becomes afraid of the weight gain that can happen through the binge eating, and so um, they are engaging in the compensatory behaviours. For ARFID, um, we're not going to go into this um, as much in detail today. It's a newer diagnosis, and this one isn't driven by a body image disturbance but by a sensory um, uh, aversion to the food in the mouth. It can be um, a phobia of food, you know, triggered by a traumatic event, or it could be like a lack of interest that the neural pathways that we experience um, and that give us joy from eating are not actually present. So one or more of those presentations can um, present in ARFID. And obviously, if you're not um, eating enough or having the, meeting the right nutritional requirements, that is going to have significant impacts on your physical health. So anorexia nervosa is the restriction of energy intake leading to significantly low body weight accompanied by an intense fear of weight gain and body image disturbance or behaviours that reflect that. So we have to be thinking about a really um, persistent cognition around body and weight and food. And when we think about how much food is a part of our daily life, you can think about how much that the eating disorder can really impact on a person's life and, of course, the impacts then on the body. And atypical anorexia nervosa is exactly the same and comes with the same physical risk and mental health risk. The only difference is that a person experiencing atypical anorexia won't meet the significantly low body weight criterion. It does require the same response by the care team. And that sits under the OSFED um, diagnostic category if you're wanting to understand the DSM. There are a few other diagnostic categories within the DSM, but I'm not going to go into detail, but this is just kind of a FYI, and you can read more about that on our website. So the prevalence of eating disorders is increasing, and it has gone up considerably since the since COVID. Um, so we don't have the best data. The, the, the best research that was done was in 2012, and now we're starting to see a few more studies come out that suggest, you know, at least 1.2 million Australians are currently experiencing an eating disorder, which is really shocking if you think 1.2 million Australians. Now, what we know is that only about 25% of people actively seek treatment for their eating disorder. So there may be other people within um, accessing mental health treatment for another presentation but are not talking about their eating disorder, but a lot actually don't seek treatment, and that can come from with a lot of different reasons and it might be shame around the eating disorder behaviours. It is that sometimes that the eating disorder um, holds a really important function in a person's life. So again, speaking to our role as mental health professionals, the importance of being able to have a conversation um, with someone about their eating and bodies as part of our normal process. Prevalence, I mean, in terms of how eating disorders present, it can present in anyone of any age, of any gender, of any sexual identity, cultural background. So we can't judge a book by its cover. We need to be screening um, at, at all instances where possible. Uh, prevalence, I know that the media has, has somewhat perpetuated, um, I guess, a focus on um, anorexia nervosa, which is really, really important, and we need to develop a system that um, can really provide a wraparound response to people who are experiencing anorexia. But it is also really important for us to be thinking about the many other people that are experiencing binge eating disorder, which is the most common eating disorder. 38% of people would have an other specified eating disorder, which also is... Um, uh, contains the atypical anorexia, and about 12% have bulimia nervosa. Within gender, binge eating disorder is about 50-50 across males and females, and we don't have great data on um, gender-diverse individuals. Um, for bulimia, 70% of people would, uh, would be female, 30% male, and then for anorexia, the data that we have would suggest around 80% of people um, with anorexia would, have, uh, would be female and 20% male. Again, data is emerging. It's not amazing at the moment, but um, the data that we do have suggests that um, eating disorders are more prevalent in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So 27% compared 
with 16% of non-Indigenous Australians. So we need to be thinking about a better wraparound response that is um, is really um, supporting a person to remain connected to their community and is really culturally safe and appropriate. So um, like all mental health presentations, the risk factors that contribute to the development of an eating disorder are complex and they, um, I guess they involve biological, psychological, behavioural and socio-cultural factors. So if we're thinking about a person's susceptibility to developing an eating disorder, it's best understood as a complex interaction between all of these factors. So understanding the risk factors helps us to think about in the room, oh, I've noticed a risk factor I need to be asking questions about their eating and bodies to see if there might be an eating disorder there. So some of the examples around biological and genetic factors, um, we need to look at a family history of eating disorders and other mental health conditions, especially knowing um, we understand the genetic predisposition around depression and anxiety. And um, around 90% uh, of people with eating disorders will experience a co-occurring condition. So you can see that there is a brain base um, to eating disorders and other mental health conditions. Transition, transition stages with major physical and social changes such as adolescence and pregnancy are really important. There is a def definitely a genetic predisposition that a lot of research is going into at the moment, which is really exciting because, you know, understanding genetic factors really helps us to develop better treatment approaches. So these include um, temperament-based traits such as perfectionism, uh, heightened sensitivity, sensitivity to negative um, evaluations, anxiety and harm avoidance. Um, dieting is a huge risk factor and dieting has just become this common thing that a lot of people just throw around. I'm on a particular diet, I've cut this food group, etc. It's a significant risk for an eating disorder. And so if people are talking about um, being on a diet or wanting to lose weight, um, we, we need to be um, identifying that. Stress is also a risk factor. And so I'm hoping as I'm explaining these, we're thinking, oh, look what's happened uh, with COVID, that um, a lot of these things are actually compounding um, and predisposing that person to um, the development of the eating disorder. Um, peer pressure, teasing or bullying, you know, comments about weight and shape, um, dieting in the family are also other factors that, that can um, help, that can, sorry, can perpetuate the problem. So the high-risk groups and presentations we need to be screening for, again, we've talked about um, weight bias. So if someone's coming to you and saying, you know, I'm unhappy with my body, I want to lose weight, I have lost weight, they're cutting out food groups, um, that we really needed to be screening to better understand um, the reasons behind that and understand what might be leading to it is an internal body image issue, is there comments coming from other people around their team, is it a health professional telling them to lose weight? because all of those will um, help us to determine um, who's in the care team, who do we need to have conversations with, um, who's going to be really supporting a person through recovery. Um, in terms of high-risk groups, uh, we need to be proactively screening um, anyone who is neurodivergent, First Nations people, LGBTQI, um, pe uh, people who identify as LGBTQI, uh, people engaging in competitive um, occupations, sports and performing arts, especially when the body is a real focus of that occupation, um, females, children and adolescents. Um, trauma is a really high risk presentation and there is um, a high co-occurrence of eating disorders and trauma. So we need to, again, be thinking about trauma-informed care and also considering um, what other services might be involved um, in addressing the trauma. Uh, we've talked about the high co-occurrence with other mental health conditions. So substance misuse is another one that often um, occurs. So we're thinking about um, engagement with uh, um, alcohol and drug service. Eating disorders and people with higher weight. So um, eating disorder diagnoses are often missed for people with higher weight because there is that, I guess, old traditional stereotype that has been perpetuated that eating disorders don't um, occur in people who are not low weight. So um, we really need, in understanding that the population comprises um, more than half of all people with eating disorders, we really need to be um, better understanding that and also think about our own um, personal um, beliefs and stigmas that might um, sit around um, weight and, and educate ourselves and understand the better language and also um, developing, a, I guess, a clinic and a room um, that supports people of all body um, weights and, and shapes. 
So we do um, need to focus on the protective factors and this is going to help you to really um, develop a, a care plan that can help to address some of these protective factors that can help some, move someone towards uh, recovery. So some of the individual factors that will protect someone from a developing an eating disorder or targets through the mental health treatment are around self-esteem, uh, body acceptance, a healthy relationship with food, and we don't talk about healthy in terms of, you know, following the, the perfect food pyramid, but it's around a relationship with food and being able to eat spontaneously and eat variety and eat socially. So it's that sort of relationship with food that we're aiming for. Having a strong connection with our community, with friends, with work and school are really, really important. Um, having connections with people that don't overemphasise weight and shape is also really important. So we've talked a lot about the risk factors, the protective factors. So what's happened in COVID? Now, if we look at that top line or so, you know, we might have all experienced some of that before. So all of the, these factors on the screen here really compound. So someone might have a genetic predisposition to developing an eating disorder and then you add on complete isolation, whether that's because you, so a person lives alone, uh, they're not connected with their work colleagues, they're not allowed to go to school, they can't do any of their extracurricular activities, there's stress in the household around work, schooling from home, uh, financial stress. Food insecurity is a big risk factor as well. And obviously with the, um, the financial implications of COVID, people were put out of work and the ongoing, um, I guess, economy in Australia at the moment means that food insecurity is rising. Um, there's been disruption to, um, to our schedules and routines and particularly around young people looking at their developmental trajectory and how that's been really impacted on them, been impacted by not being able to go to school and engage in the normal activities that they would. So these are some of the factors that our, our moderators will be guiding you through to think about what needs to happen for people, even though hopefully we're out of the, the dark depths of, of COVID, we know that it's still, um, the impacts are still there. So coming up with a care plan, we need to think about the impact of eating disorders on a person. When we go back to the diagnostic criteria and we think about the impacts of restriction, um, binging and purging, excessive exercise and other eating disorder behaviours, um, the impact that that can have on all parts of the body. Um, so through the heart, the gastrointestinal tract, our skin, our teeth, all those things. So of course we need to be thinking about medical and physical care. We need a mental health approach to actually be targeting the eating disorder cognitions, but we need to be thinking about the impact on a person's education, their occupation, uh, their engagement or re-engagement in extracurricular activities or things that they used to do before the eating disorder happened. The impact in the, on the family and in the house that an eating disorder can impact have a significant impact on those people closest to them. Um, the other thing is that, you know, an eating disorder can lead to a lot of withdrawal from social relationships. And so how can we support a person to, to get, um, to reconnect um, where they had it, um, had strong uh, friendships and work colleagues and family? And of course, there can be a really um, significant financial impact of eating disorder behaviours. So I'm not going to go into early identification too much. There is um, free early e-learning um, for mental health professionals available on our website that you'll receive the link to. But to be able to do this, we need to know the warning signs. As mental health professionals, we all have a role. And so we need to be able to um, be kind of have that flag in our head at all times. And then understanding what's next. And so after we do the we identify we do the screening and assessment. So now we know what the high risk groups and presentations are. We need to learn about having a conversation about bodies and eating if that's something that doesn't feel comfortable for you at the moment. Understanding um, psychometric tools that you might like to use. Um, completing that full assessment, including the risk and making sure that a person is linked in with a medical practitioner if we're the only person in that care team to start with. Again, excellent resources and things through the e-learning if you'd like to access that um, after the conference. So when you're thinking about a care or treatment plan when you move into your breakout room, some of the things I want you to just to be keep in mind is that the person is always at the centre of the care plan. So we need to be thinking about the whole of person. What is the impact that this eating disorder is having on a person's life across all of those um, areas that I just outlined? 
The treatment plan needs to be culturally safe and sensitive and appropriate. Um, it needs to be recovery or, oriented. What would recovery look like for that person? Is it as a complete absence of eating disorder behaviours? Is it that they're re-engaging in work or, you know, friendships or outings? Um, trauma is really, really important. So it can't, always comes from a trauma-informed lens. And that early intervention is really, really effective. So when we identify and respond to an eating disorder, even if you're not providing the full treatment approach, such as, you know, a, an evidence-based treatment model, providing psychoeducation and engaging someone and, you know, using some motivational techniques is, is really, really effective early intervention. And, you know, the earlier we do that, the better outcomes for the person. And I want us to be thinking about our own professional responsibility. You do work across so many different settings. And so you need to think about what's my experience, what's my training, what do I feel that um, I can do within my own scope, and what do I need to do to be able to do more, you know, around extra training and supervision. So if you're in a work setting that's like, well, I'm not going to be providing the treatment, then it's about well, what will my roles uh, look like within the team and where else do I need to refer to? So where would we be referring to? So I'm going to draw your attention back to that overarching framework that I introduced at the start. Treatment can occur in the community, um, in an intensive community setting, and also in hospital. Most people recover in the community. Hospital treatment is needed for less than 5% um, of people, and recovery doesn't happen in hospital. That's there to, uh, in response to medical risk, psychiatric risk, or a really um, significant interruption of the eating disorder behaviours if community treatment um, isn't able to establish that. So we're really thinking about community-based treatment and then using the other levels of treatment where appropriate. And again, it's that interdisciplinary care that's really important here, that you will be required to talk with other services if that's what's required for the person. When you're thinking about, again, the treatment plan, you're going through mental health, what's needed, physical, nutritional and psychosocial. Family and other supports is really crucial to your care team as well. Who is going to really help that person in, at home? There's a lot of time between appointments to move towards recovery and really helping a person to re-engage with their community um, and life. I've mentioned this throughout, but just to give you a, a visual description of what a care team um, should look like is that a minimum care team is a mental health professional and medical, but in most instances, there's other people involved. So dietitians are often involved, psychiatrists and paediatricians can be, especially if there are Medicare items um, that are being used other health and medical specialists as needed and really addressing the psychosocial aspects. And the lived experience workforce is a really key one that prob probably is definitely isn't being used as well as it should be at the moment. So peer support um, and family support are also areas that you can explore. MBS items are available. So there's the eating sort of management plans for anorexia nervosa and severe presentations, and also our mental health care plans and um, chronic disease management plans. So treatment plans, we can do this privately um, and we can also be thinking about the public system and, and low cost options. So I am going to stop sharing my screen for a moment because I am going to introduce our wonderful um, moderators to the, uh, I think they're gonna pop up. So um, thank you so much tech team. Um, and once their cameras are on, these are the faces to the name. So I've been talking about the moderators. I gave you a very brief bio that, and you can access their um, more comprehensive bio in the conference platform. We've got Dr. Emma Steele, Rachel Knight, Katrina Henry, um, and Amy Davis. And that each of these will be leading one of their four breakout rooms um, in the next section. Welcome back, everybody. I can see the numbers um, slowly increasing um, as people are jumping back in the room. Um, we'll get started. Um, I think that we were up over 500 people, which I'm just amazed, uh, just incredible to have. Um, all I get is a 500 plus, so I don't know how much higher that it goes from there. But uh, thank you so much. Um, just amazing turnout. And, and thank you for your commitment to upskilling in this area. 
Um, I'm going to be joined here by our four moderators um, who are going to provide feedback on the group and I'm going to do my best at kind of synthesising and bringing together some of those common themes. I jumped like a uh, you know, very busy person through that last hour. I think I spent like a few minutes in each room and just went around in circles, but I really picked up on common themes that were popping up, but also really different cases. Um, and thank you so much to the moderators for doing a brilliant job. Um, we're going to start um, with Rachel Knight uh, to provide feedback on her session, if that's okay. Um, so just thinking about kind of the collaborative care, you know, how does that work for your case? You know, how does that contribute to a better outcome for the, you know, the person experiencing an eating disorder? And any key messages, if you had time to process all of that in that hour, Rach? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I will just start off by saying, like, in um, our breakout group, we had a very fast and furious conversation. Everybody, there was so much going on across the Q&A and the chat and also people contributing. And I just, it was an, an amazing um session with lots of different inputs and stuff which made it very exciting but it did make it very hard for me I did not take notes well because I was too busy responding to everyone so I'm going to do my best to represent um, the broad themes across our, our discussion mm. so um, so the, the vignette we worked with was somebody with binge eating disorder who also had a traumatic um, episode in relation to a sexual assault um, so we were presented with a complex um, presentation where somebody had um, outstanding or, or, or tr a trauma experience that hadn't been discussed or disclosed at all alongside a binge eating disorder that had developed post that traumatic event. Um, and they'd had a, um, a recent episode where they decided to take their own life. And in fact, that was the first foray sort of in 10 plus years since the assault that they'd had the opportunity to have contact with mental health services. So um, this person had, had some, um, had gone to the GP for some support and been um and sent to a dietitian and a weight loss program and started on some medication. Um, but this, you know, attempt on her life was the first opportunity she'd had to be seen by mental health professionals. So that in itself was important for us in our discussion because it was the first opportunity that we'd had to be able to diagnose the eating disorder accurately, mm -hmm. diagnose what had been going on, understand what had been going on for the particular person and think about how we could work collaboratively to support her. There was a lot of opportunities there. Um, we talked a lot about sort of overlap between trauma and eating disorders and, and how we would respond to each of those and how they, they might be responded together or separately. Um, and we spoke about doing that alongside management of risk. Um, there were a number of hurdles and challenges, particularly this person was very socially isolated um, and the fact that her, um, her difficulties had gone undiagnosed and not understood for such a long period of time. So the challenge, and particularly in relation to her family networks. So um, there was a bit of distance between her family and the perpetrator of her sexual assault had strong connections with her family as well, which caused a number of problems. And so we had to think really carefully around how and when we might engage the family in the treatment plan, recognising that that was important, but we also wanted to respect the wishes of the person themselves and their experience that, that they hadn't yet actually disclosed. So we did recognise that the first, keeping things simple was probably really important for Jodie, who was our vignette, which was really about how can we engage her, how can we build a trusting relationship with her and to support her to be safe. So they were kind of the first three things right off the bat. And we also recognised that, you know, you don't need to be an eating disorder specialist to do those things. There's something we all do as health professionals mm. every day and where we're all able to do. Um, and if we did that, we were well on the way to supporting this, this lady in her recovery. Um, we did talk about what, so communicate, communicating, so how we communicated with her, how we interacted with her, how we supported with her to share what was going on for her and what she wanted to do. And we did sort of make a point that as part of her care plan, it would be important to understand what she wanted to do and when and how we could address those in order to improve her quality of life. But we also discussed thinking about different structured interventions that we could use as well. Um, so we talked about things like um, CBTE, CBT for, get, for eating disorders, and the different versions of that, so including guided self-help and the CBT 10 sessions, 10 session models, as well as things that might have been a little bit more transdiagnostic, such as EMDR, ACT, um, acceptance and commitment therapy, and a dialectical behavioural therapy. Mm. Um, 
we did recognise the need for a multidisciplinary team and there was lots of talk around sort of, the, the, of course, with me being an OT, thinking about the impact or the involvement that OT could have in eating disorders. Um, but we also recognise the importance of all the other, of other disciplines as well. So thinking about psychology, thinking about psychiatry, thinking about keeping involvement with the GP and potentially others as we go a bit of an understanding for what Jodie needed and wanted to do with her life and how we could engage her moving forward. Beautiful. Uh, is there anything else that I can share? I think that is absolutely uh you know, excellent summary, Rach, because it was a really complex case and I would encourage those that weren't in Rachel's room to have a read through the vignette and actually just have a think about, um, you know, what Rachel has said also. But, you know, if that case, um, you know, if that person was in, sitting in front of you, what you might do. But some of those really key things, Rach, around um, all of us have a role in just engaging and listening and, and making someone feel safe to share yeah. their story. Um, and yeah. that might be around trauma, but also their story of the eating disorder, because it's hard, it can be really hard to disclose that. So I think yeah. absolutely key messages there, um, Rach, and just starting small, that yeah. we don't have to bring in a huge care team at the start. It's that we're engaging the person, we're doing comprehensive assessment, understanding them, and then being able to bring in other professionals as needed. And depending right. on your scope of practice, maybe you are the, just the, the central port of it. And then we are bringing other professionals, perhaps do focused trauma counselling or, or whatever else might be needed. Absolutely. Yes, Thank you so much. Um, we'll have to jump on to Amy, if that's okay. Uh, quite a different case um, that Amy, you'll be talking about. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, so our uh, our case on EV had a pretty complex presentation as well with a lot of physical symptoms um, and we really kind of focused on the transition stage that Evie was at. So, um, so Evie was an 18-year-old mm -hmm. who had already undertaken eating disorder treatment as, as an adolescent um, and then was identified to, um, you know, either be relapsing or potentially have not completely recovered from um, her previous, uh, you know, treatment. Um, so we really talked about the transition from adolescence to our adulthood and the team, the team I was mm. talking with were really able to identify maybe that, that need for more autonomy um, whilst continuing to um, be able to include support people um, in her recovery um, and, you know, that idea around moving to a more individual treatment um, you know, and the, then we talked about the clinicians that may need to be involved um, in that individual treatment and really then just the importance of communication of that treating team um, because this was a presentation that would have been um, considered an atypical anorexia nervosa and so the goals of treatment kind of just ensuring all clinicians were on the same page um, in terms of um, recovery and what that looked like. Mm -hmm. um, so then, yeah, that communication theme really came through as well. Yeah, beautiful. Thanks, Amy. I think um, something that came up when I was in your room too is thinking about, I mean, I think that the transition, transitional stage is just such an important thing for clinicians to be mindful of and it's most services aren't set up. You know, we have this public system that's like at 18 then you cut off and you move into an adult system but you know they're in such a like it's just such a tricky developmental period for them because there's so much change happening that they are becoming an adult they might be moving out of home and so what's the role of the parents in this case um, versus how much are we doing individually and I also think for Amy when she was involved in so many different um, sports and gyms and that's where her, her sense of connection and meaning came from in life so what are the messages mm. you know when we're thinking about interdisciplinary care and who might be involved in a care team what are the messages that coaches and peers are going to be giving Amy versus what the treating team are going to be providing and what that might feel like for her if she's getting competing messages so really important to be looking at that whole person because if we weren't exploring the you know the importance of sports and gym and exercise in her life we'd be missing a whole aspect of her of her treatment plan um yeah uh, I think weight stigma was also, you know, uh, raised in your group too that 
Um, Amy had lost weight and, you know, she sat within the normal BMI and so really supporting a person to understand and providing the right psychoeducation around, you know, um, our set point. So, you know, what is our biological predisposition to being a particular weight and supporting someone to feel safe and okay to move beyond the weight that their cutoff had been at and that they might need may need to move to a higher weight and what that might um, bring about from their family and, and other people around them if, if, if her weight did change. So um, I think that psychoeducation and who's providing it, you know, the nutritional stuff, the biological stuff, the mental health, that's how the care team really needs to be talking about who's, who's saying what. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Amy. Uh, Katrina, we're going to jump to you to another younger case. Yes. Uh, much the same as Rachel's group, lots going on in the chat and feel like, you know, couldn't really respond to everybody's questions. <laughs> um, but I guess, you know, in terms of the Katie's situation, I mean, it sounded like a very, you know, just a very typical presentation. But as we sort of were talking about it, it was more like, okay, what are the considerations that we need to be looking at here in terms of Katie is only 12 and, you know, who is it that she's presenting to, but who is in her care team, but also who might be those other people in her support system that might then be coming to your service as those other people and how how do we have those discussions? What sorts of skills and knowledge do we need to have around having those conversations? Particularly, you know, there was a grandparent that had made a comment around sort of that weight stigma and, you know, having to be a certain weight and shape. And, you know, there was lots of sort of comments in terms of Katie's age being, you know, that sort of pre-adolescence moving into that transition, um, all with COVID and all of those changes that come along with adolescence, as well as the change of COVID, the, you know, all of those sort of stresses and anxieties that come up um, in normal adolescence, but then adding on top of that, the isolation maybe with COVID and, you know, all of the situation that's happening at home, things like that. So there was, yes, lots of discussion about who might be in that team and, you know, in terms of that early identification, um, Mm -hmm. you know, really important in terms of the physical aspects. So lots of Mm -hmm. people were commenting on, you know, the physical aspects for Katie, really important to get her to a GP and, you know, sort of assess that everything is physically okay for Katie. Um, But also, yes, involving a dietitian, involving the school, involving like the school counsellor, the parents, grandparents, um, you know, and who in each of that sort of settings can play a role. Just like you were saying, everybody can play a role in that. It's not just singled out into this is treatment for Katie and what does that look like? Yeah, absolutely. I think there is an important one there too, Katrina, around restriction in, you know, a 12-year-old girl and the impact that that can have on her physical development. Um, and obviously, you know, um, you know, in, if there's then impact on other areas of her development as well. So really important to be bringing in the right care team to address um, those issues. Um, the other, uh, I guess, um, thing that kind of uh, was raised in your group was around aligning the care team. We can hear that there are comments coming from grandparents and you know, possibly other people around her, possibly peers and those sort of things. So we're really needing to align the care team on, you know, what are the risks here with the restriction? Um, what are Absolutely. our messages? How are we best supporting um, Katie to, um, you know, continue to have the right intake for to support development? You know, young people shouldn't be losing any weight, you know, that's really, exactly. really damaging to their physical development. So um, absolutely yeah. agree that, you know, we've, there's a few comments in there around BMI that comes from Amy's group and also Katrina's that BMI is a really damaging, outdated thing to use and it's not what we should be should looking at. We've got to look at the whole person. So really, really important. The other common theme that um, was um, raised across different groups and, and was in yours, Katrina, was around the co-occurring conditions. So when there's there's anxiety um, and, and low mood and it's like, what are we treating first? Is it you know, And also chicken or the egg, you know, because we yes. know that restriction can increase anxiety and, and worsen mood. So really important to be thinking about the the. I guess, the sequence of the treatment plan. And, I mean, that was one of the discussions that we had in terms of, yeah, if this is the presentation that they're presenting for anxiety, depression, it might be more of those general mental health issues, but then which is the priority? How do we prioritise what it is that we need to be focusing on? And, yeah, there was some comments around sort of an individual approach for Katie because what's actually going on for Katie as opposed to, you know, she probably meets criteria for anorexia nervosa and, 
what's the best treatment outcomes mm. for anorexia nervosa in a 12-year-old and, you yeah. know, trying to intervene and support the family to step in and take some, um, yeah, to be able to support Katie. Absolutely. Early intervention. If anyone takes anything away today, it's early intervention. We, we <laughs> need to do something quickly and starting small. <laughs> um, em, I'm going to jump to you for our final case. Again, really active room. I, I didn't want to leave. Ah, great. Thanks, Sarah. I can see that my connection might be not great. Am I coming through okay? Yep. Yep. Great. So um, I had a very similar wonderful problem that I had a very active room and I hope I can kind of feed back and do that justice. Um, so to let you know a bit about our case, so we were talking about Alex, who's a 32-year-old trans man who lives in rural um, Queensland. And so Alex didn't really have any sort of substantial eating disorder history. Um, but after the macadamia crop kind of went bust from the terrible weather related to climate change, um, they had been um, binge eating for probably about three months. Um, so one of the kind of key themes that I think came from our group was really how do we rest back on key principles and existing skills that we already have to try and make sense of and understand what's going on for Alex? So um, I guess similar to what I've heard from other groups, there was a real kind of motivation in our group to try and understand from Alex's perspective, you know, what are the kind of things that have happened to him in his life that might have predisposed him to this? So um, things like, um, you know, understanding um if he has kind of like in his history, like some sort of family history of an eating disorder, also understanding a little bit around um, the kind of current factors that might um, be impacting upon his experience of his body and some of the concerns mm -hmm. that he has around that. So really trying to understand, um, you know, the relationship that he has with his body and his gender identity. And again, um, you know, it's we really kind of had this robust discussion around the complexities of what on the surface looks like a problem with food and eating, but actually you really need to take into account a lot around the person's um, experience of their body, what does their body mean to them. And for Alex there was a really strong component around um, gender and gender expression within the body. Mm. Um the other thing that sort of came from the group, which um, sort of around collaborative care was trying to kind of really make sure that we're looking at the kinds of health practitioners that might be required to give Alex the care that he needs, but also thinking more broadly around and, and similar to what other people have talked about, what are the sort of um, social networks that Alex has and are they um, supportive of and affirming of his body experience? Um, you know, mm. what's it like in his relationship to try and understand um, how he navigates, um, you know, that within his intimate relationship, What, how supportive are his family and can we work with him and them to try and, um, you know, I guess address some of those social factors that might be contributing to, um, you know, uh, mm issues around how he experiences his body. Mm -hmm. um, the other really important thing that kind of came up from our group um, was trying to understand and, and it kind of came out the, you know, helping Alex to understand and step back from what's happening from him, uh, from to him in terms of those kind of maintaining factors. And again, it was really kind of resting back on the skills that uh, that we already use kind of as professionals to formulate and understand where we might be able to get someone out of a vicious cycle. So really mm -hmm. kind of looking at things like thinking styles and intervening um, on behaviours um, and um, really kind of looking at strengths that would help Alex to kind of... Um, you know, feel motivated to continue to address this and to um, align with him on what his goals are and what makes meaning and purpose for him um, in his recovery and in, in work on that. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Some Beautiful, and thank you. There was there was so much that, that kind of came up in your group and I think that um, the experience of their body is a really important one and, look, the, the um, chat is really active and there's a lot of... Um, comments about bodies and weight and and you know like ah uh, 
it's some of it's it, it's hard you know the the experience that people um have from health professionals talking about bodies and and really inappropriate advice is is shocking and we've got a lot of work to do so i hope i'm preaching to the converted but there are clinical guidelines that NADC launched last year on the management of eating disorders in people with higher weight and that comes from a weight stigma lens just saying this is this is harmful what's happening so really encourage you to um, have a read through of that and use the resources and spread the word and see yourself as champions but um, I think Em that something came up that was quite similar across the the groups was that sense of control um, that sometimes there's a lack of control there's an attempt at controlling food or exercise and those sort of things when other things seem to be out of control again so the importance of looking at the entire person and digging deep and then just saying oh, okay this person might have binge eating disorder really like what you said Em, you've got to actually get down deeper and say what what's the experience for him why is this happening and you know something important was how do we support someone to share their experience with us but also those people that are closer to them you know how do we support them to share with their partner that they might be binge eating because that can be a really difficult conversation um some of the i'm, I'm going to kind of try and summarize with it in a, in a few minutes just some of the key things that came out um the idea of engaging with supports and creating connection is absolutely vital for it doesn't matter who is sitting in front of you that you know in all of the vignettes there were there were um episodes of feeling isolation I'm um, isolated. So there was comment around COVID being gone. COVID hasn't gone. I've just recovered myself after having 10 days in bed. Definitely hasn't gone, but lockdowns have gone. So, but, you know, we can think about isolation through COVID and how, how much that impacted on people's lives. And, but also now that we're not locked down necessarily, but how we can really support someone to um, remain connected with their community um, and with their culture um, with their interests and activities, and that's a really key role that we would do across diagnostic presentations, not just eating disorders. So using our normal clinical skills, we can really focus on that. And I think that's a skill, it doesn't matter what profession you are, under the mental health umbrella, we can all do that sort of work. Something I think that was in your room, Rach, something came up around the cultural aspect of eating, which I think was absolutely beautiful and something I hadn't thought about before. It's like, you know, eating foods that are relevant to your culture can just bring about that sense of belonging and identity and we're connecting a person to their community and their background through that process of eating. So eating has just so much importance in people's lives so we can be thinking about that. Um, then I guess the, the care team, I think that, I mean, all of the messages were around we need a care team in this. The care team is mental health and medical at the minimum, but we need to be thinking about, you know, the broader connections with the community. And if you're not the best place person because of the role that you're in, some services are limited in what you can provide, um, then really thinking about what other services might be able to support a person to just remain connected, connected and um, having the supports included um, and engaged in the treatment are the most important things. Ah, my brain's got so many different thoughts swirling around. Um, thank you so much, moderators. That was absolutely brilliant. And I hope that the 500 plus people um, here today have learnt um, a lot from the sessions. And as I said, in encourage you to go back to the vignettes and, and have a look um, at um, those that were presented in the other groups. Really, really quickly, I'm just sharing my screen again. Um, all of the resources, um, they will be provided to you um, that we've talked about encourage please read the management of eating disorders in people with high weight and spread the word um, I'm trying to share screen coming up <laughs> uh, there's an eating disorders networking hub tomorrow at 10 a.m really encourage you to join that um, connect with other people in this space um, this shouldn't be a lonely slog you know um, there are so many people joining the eating sort of sector and we realise that eating disorders are not a specialist thing. It's something that um, we all have the skills to be able to do um, and I hope that the information we've provided um, you today provide, you know, has increased your confidence and willingness to do this work and that the resources we provide you and the connections um, will help you after that. Um, there is also a hypothetical live from 7pm um, Eastern uh, Standard Daylight Savings Time and please check the schedule. There's so much um, um, happening in the next couple of days um, and hopefully we will cross paths again. Um, thank you for joining. It's one minute to five. I, I believe we've landed on the mark here. Um, before you log off, if you could please complete the feedback survey 
um, by clicking on the survey tab on the right hand side. Um, really important for us to receive feedback for MHPN to receive feedback on this style of um, workshop. Have a lovely evening, lovely afternoon to everyone in WA um, and look forward to seeing you in the next couple of days.